So thank you for this introduction. It is true that uh, I'm quite out of the field you are dealing with because uh, you are discussing the variability of parameters I didn't even know before. So, <coughs> uh, But uh, I, I was happy to uh, answer positively this invitation because it's, it's always important to remember to which extent we are not, uh, not alone at all and to which extent this is deeply influencing most of the things around us in and I say this without any pretension, in any profession indeed. So, the idea you offered me was to present you the gut microbiota as the gate to the organism and to discuss this a bit related to, to nutrition. The gate. The gate is the entrance and the entrance is uh, sometimes hidden if you think of it. But uh, the entrance of the organism is something which, uh, which is always microbial. And that will be my first point. I was looking a bit on which animal is the which for which we have the most document on what are the microbes at each gate of the organism. And I'm sorry, the only one I found, you, you know it, by the way, but, and you feed it indirectly. It's not very... Uh, anything with, uh, linked with directly agriculture. It's humans. And when you look at humans being, you see a lot of microbes which are at every gate to the organism. The skin. Also, all the digestive tract. At lining along all these digestive tracts. Think that for our in intestine, it's 250 square meters of contact between the epithelium and you would say the food, but more really between the epithelium and microbes. We also have it in the vagina, we have it in the nostrils, in the mouth. Everywhere where we have a contact to outside, it is a contact to microbes. And the result is that, well, the, the microbial cells are quite small, but we have as many human cells as uh, bacteria in the gut. And this idea that there is uh, the same number of uh, microbes and cells is, it seems, applying to any animals. We are not an exception in this respect. We tend to be very clean, by the way, and to be rather an exception in the other direction that we have a bit less microbes than expected if we were living in the wild. And today, of course, uh, the one, the, the, the microbiota that will be of interest for us will be the gut microbiota, which is highly diverse. And uh, uh, my question will be a bit to address with you what exactly this microbiota is doing. And you will see that it's not only present in number, but it's also present in functions. Let's start with a bit of digestion. Uh, here we discuss the gate the food is taking to enter our body. I will introduce my... my my ideas with an animal which is paroxystic in terms of the role gut microbiota have in digestion. Because what I will show you is something that should not exist. And I will come back to that and to tell you exactly why it shouldn't exist. That's the co. And uh, many people consider the co as a typical herbivorous animal. Okay. Co's are spending a lot of time ruminating, looking like doing nothing. It's 10 hours per day of just masticating like that. And when you see them eating, they, they look herbivorous, but they are not. Uh, to make you convinced that uh, this animal is not able to digest grass, I just will go to the other end of the digestive tract. And when I investigate the, 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 the sheets of the cow, it's obvious that there are pieces of herb. And when I investigate Chemically speaking, with stains that are able to stain either lignin in green or cellulose in, in, in pink, it's obvious that in those remains, nothing which is the most abundant compounds of herb, that is lignin and cellulose, was digested. So there is here the evidence in any cow sheets that cows do not digest herbs. Well, I guess it's not a big mystery for you. Most of you know that this animal has a rumen. 
that is a big outgrowth of uh, the uh, part of the stomach which is connected to the hydrophagus, which is a big pouch filled with water, something like 100 to 250 liters of water and all the herbs that are coming in. And of course, since this is at, uh, of course, protected from oxygen, there is here a huge number of bacterial and, and also uh, protist cells that are developing something like millions of billions of the cells which are developing. And this is producing a lot of wastes. Those wastes are uh, mostly the volatile fatty acids like uh, propionic acid, acetic acid, butyric acid, which, is, which are making the smell of the coal. But this is 85% of the energy the coal is using. The, the glycemic, as you may know, in the core is very low. It's not sugar which, which is providing energy to the cell. It's those wastes of the microbes. So already we solved the problem of how this animal, which is not able to digest grass, is obtaining energy. Just wastes, microbial wastes. Now let's go on, because we need also a bit of proteins. You were discussing this a lot. And we need um, um, nucleic acids and all the stuff. The uh, distal part of the rumen, of this big pouch where the microbes are produced, is a kind of screen, a kind of uh, sieve, if you prefer, where only small microbes and small pieces of herbs are going through. The pieces of herbs, you sow it, if they go through this sieve, they will not be digested. But for all the microbial cells, they will be digested. And digested, and 15% of the enzymes in the intestine of the cows are lysozyme. That is an enzyme which is destroying the bacterial cell wall. So it's really a digestion of microbes, which is producing all but the energy the cow is in need of. And we still didn't finish with this idea why the cow is masticating. Look. The co masticates something it's expelling from the rumen. So it's already these herbs, this mix of herbs and water which is in the rumen that is masticated, destroyed into smaller species, which allows better attack by the microbes because it's increasing the surface available to microbial attack. But there is another thing here happening. It is that the co is producing a saliva in which it's pushing all its own wastes like the phosphorus, it doesn't need any more, like the urea or the uric acid, which are not expelled through the urine, but through the saliva, and which are simply fertilizer for this rumen. So if you think of it, there is a reciprocal waste exchange. The co is uh, giving the, the waste of its metabolism to the microbes, which are reciprocally giving it largely, a part of their body, of course, but also part or all of their wastes. And if you think of it, the co is not an herbivore. It's either eating bacteria which are eating herbs, or eating protozoans, or protists, that are eating bacteria, that are eating herbs. So it's a consumer of order two or three in the trophic chain. It's not eating herb. It's eating things which are eating herbs. But when you look at the trophic chain in the field, macroscopically, this animal looks as a consumer of herb. You have in this pyramid of production of biomass exactly the expected 10 times loss per trophic level, which we expect if co is eating herbs or boys are eating cows. That is that, ecologically speaking, this animal is an herbivorous animal. But technically speaking, it is not an herbivorous animal. It is eating herbivores. And the solution to this conundrum is very easy. This is efficiency of the symbiosis. First, the co doesn't have to reach its food. Its food is already in it. So the cost of accessing the food is paid only once by the consortium of the co and the bacteria and the protist and so on. But the second thing is that there is a huge efficiency due to cross-exchange of wastes. And this makes the cows a better herbivore than horses. Because for horses, you need 15 to 20% more space and herb to feed a, a horse than a cow. So you realize that it's more efficient 
than a pure herbivore, if I may call a horse a true herbivore, because in horse there is not rumen and there is no rumination and there is no microbes behind. You know, uh, this story is a story that emerged repetitively in evolution. Let's go now a bit under the sea. This is a whale, a mink whale, and as many whales, you know, it's having no teeth. It's a, a misty set, exactly speaking. And those misty sets, uh, they are eating uh, not big prey, but they are filtering krill. Krill is very small shrimps. So let's stop one minute with shrimps. You've been eating shrimps already. What are you doing with the shrimps? First thing you do before eating it. You peel it. OK, you may not peel it if it's a very small one, but most of the time you have to peel it. So let's come back to this animal, which has a lot of shrimps to peel. And it has to peel it, because otherwise the enzymes will not go into the flesh. <laughs> if you look at the digestive tract of this animal, there is a big, enormous protrusion before the stomach. What's there? Bacteria. Ketinolytic bacteria that are destroying the skin of the krill. So once again, this animal would not have access to its food, which you will further digest, without bacteria killing the chitin. And the bacteria are also flowing into the digestive tract, so part of them will be also digested afterward. So you see, this story arose many times in evolution, even under the sea that you have help of bacteria to access a food you would not access otherwise. Well, the problem is that for most animals, they cannot digest their bacteria because uh, they have bacteria, but it's behind the stomach. So you cannot digest them. We have bacteria, but they are too far away in the digestive tract to be digested. Well, there is a first option. Sorry, we were reaching the time of eating, but I have to mention it because that evolved many times in evolution, which is to eat special feces, which are made of bacteria. Uh, many animals are coprophagous. They have two kinds of sheets, the sheets which is purely waste, and the ones which are just a, a condensate of bacteria. You never saw those sheets because they are immediately eaten, as you can see. And uh, they are sometimes 10 times richer in proteins than the food they ingest otherwise. So the specific uh, sheets they eat is a way of re-digesting bacteria that are very near the distal part of the digestive tract. But you know, you don't need coprophagy to use your bacteria. <laughs> uh, you, you, are, you make a good point by laughing, because we, we, we do use our bacteria, and we don't need that. Uh, Monogastrix, as we call those animals with a very simple, very primitive stomach, as we have, they have bacteria in the intestine which are breaking down in simple molecules the complex ones that they are eating. They do the same as their own enzymes in this respect. This is allowing to develop bacteria, to, to make bacterial biomass, and it's producing fermentative waste, once again, the same as previously, uh, butyrate, propionate, acetate. This is also going to, to produce dead cells. Some of the cells have accidents. They, they, they break, they, they, they liberate their, con their content. And all that can be used by the gut epithelial cells. We have now the possibility of studying exactly what I mentioned here by using animals, especially mouse, which are germ-free. <coughs> they, are, they are grown in a purely axenic, sterile environment for generations, and they have no bacteria, nor on the skin, nor in the ears, nor in the gut. And by studying those bacteria, it turns out that this story is quite relevant. This is 5 to 50% of their metabolic, uh, of the energy they get, because they can use this in the liver, this in the intestine. So those molecules are contributing, much less than for cause, but still a bit to metabolism. This is also true for you. 10% of your energy is coming from that. Dead cells, they are very important because they contain vitamins. And those mouse which are axenic, they need some vitamins that they normally don't need when they are wild. So it means that in the dead cells, there is vitaminic resources. And finally, 
we know also, but I will not detail that, that there is a couple of molecules from the food of the mice which are only destroyed by the microbes. And if you want to feed an axenic mouse, you need 30% more food to gain not even exactly the same weight. They are very lean, indeed, as compared to normal mice. OK, so I think that the story is clear. The gate for the food is, by way of microbes, largely. But it's also a protection. And speaking of that, a gate is, for, first of all, a protection. And we tend to think that our body has limits, that we organize ourselves, and at which we are selecting ourselves, what's coming in, or not. And it's not very true. Let's come back to cause. Sorry, it's my favorite example, and it may not be exactly what you prefer feeding, but still it's edible. Um, in Australia, cows were introduced because, as you know, they were not present before, and the growers started to introduce a legume tree called Lecaina, which was very used in the tropics because you, you plant it in the field and the animals are grazing a bit of this uh, bush, which is rich in nitrogen. So it was very used as a source of, of nitrogen throughout the tropics. So it looked like a good idea in Austria, in Australia, sorry. It turned out not to be. And all the ruminants turned out to have big problem of growth or even, or even survival or even reproduction when eating this in Austra Australia, whether, whereas they had no problem with it worldwide. It turned out that they had a problem with mimosine, an alkaloid which is highly toxic, which is interfering with the hormonal process. It's a kind of, of uh, endocrine perturbator. And it was a bit bizarre because, once again, that was not a problem for most of the cows worldwide. Jones, uh, Raymond Jones, decided to study that by going to Hawaii and Indonesia and to look at animals that were eating locaina without having any problems. And his idea was that probably there was a bacteria in their gut that was doing the job. He took a bit of Roman flora from those animals, inoculated it to Australian, Australian cows and goats, and suddenly they turned into being able to eat leucaina. So he fully solved the problem because detoxification of this was done by bacteria. By the way, now, this bacteria is called, from his name, Synergistes genesi, and it's very now possible to inoculate it from cultures. So you see that here the toxicity of a product is simply circumvented by the bacteria, and the protection is bacterial. And nowadays, it's very uh, common to see in Australia those leucaina planted with the cows growing perfectly around. In the rumen, there is a lot of protection against this, which is a chelatant, uh, chelating iron, chelating magnesium or calcium, which is the source of food of some oxalibacters. Tannins are partly oxidized into uh, non, not or less dangerous derivatives by the gut microbiota. And also you have a lot of cyanogenic compounds which are simply destroyed by the gut bacteria of animals, of, uh, of uh, ruminants. I will now show you an animal which has a quite extreme food, which is Creosote. This small tree here is a creosote bush. It's highly toxic. You may know that the extract of creosote is what we used in museums to preserve insects. And it's highly carcinogenic, highly toxic. Most of my colleagues in the entomology lab are dead on the recent years from uh, brain cancer, which is due to creosote. So it's really a bad story, creosote, but this is the only food of this uh, small neotoma. And this neotoma, you know, when you give him creosote, it's developing well. It's the survival is 100% all over the time of the experiment. Now, let's give him antibiotics. We kill his gut microflora, his, his gut microbiota, and a normal food. You see that the survival is less good, but most individuals are surviving. Now, we kill by antibiotics all his microbiota, and we give him creosote, and then it goes to death. Everyone is dead within 12 days. So it means that this animal is not tolerating this highly toxic food. It is just having the bacteria for it. So you see that 
we are sometimes not adapted to our food. <laughs> Only our bacteria are doing the job. This is a specific crozot feeder which cannot tolerate the toxins <coughs> of crozot, not more than me. Simply compared to me and my poor colleague from the entomology collection at the museum, this animal has the good bacteria. Okay, now I would like to make you aware that the gate has also a face inside. The gate is not facing the outside only, it's also facing the inside. What I mean here is that those microbes at the gate, their role in nutrition is not only a role outside. So far they were digesting, producing vitamins, protecting, but they were still outside in the gut. They also have a role inside. I will be short on that, but you probably heard already of that, that they are manipulating positively when we are healthy, but also negatively in some case, our metabolism. Let's take two twins. One is obese and the other one is lean. And we inject into axenic mice, you know those mice that I show you, which are fully living without microbes, we inject the mice their microbiota. And this results soon into adiposity and overweight in the mouse that receive the gut microbiota of the obese twin, whereas the mice that receive the bacteria from the lean twin, well, they are a bit bigger because they digest better, but they still have a normal size and no adiposity for those animals. It turns out today that one of the causing agents of obesity in humans, but not only in humans, is the microbiota or a specific microbiota. A specific microbiota, uh, once again, I, I, mean, I don't mean that is the whole explanation of obesity, which has also environmental causes and genetic causes, but the fact is that part of what makes obesity is a microbiota which is, one, not having the same composition as the microbiota of healthy individuals, and second, which is less diverse. That is, the diversity of microbes is much reduced in obese individuals. This means that there is a regulation of the adipose tissues and the metabolism. And indeed, we start to know that there is a complex interaction between gut microbiota and the brain. It's better known for mouse than for humans, but we know that uh, the gut microbiota of obese individuals is producing a lot more of acetate, and that this high level of acetate is, on the mouse brain, producing several effects, which are producing, as a result, obesity. First, by way of the vagus nerve, it's enhancing the secretion of insulin, which is enhancing the ability of the cells to take up the metabolites from the blood and make it into reserves. Second, by way of the uh, vagus nerve, again, there is action on the stomach which goes, which enhance the production of an hormone, the ghrelin, which back to the brain is enhancing the food intake by simply lowering the satiety. You eat, but you still feel hungry <coughs> because you don't feel anymore the signals that you've been eating. By the way, one of the most efficient signals that you've been eating, which is making this lasting feeling of not being hungry anymore, well, the very first one is mastication. The second one is making the stomach full. This is lowering our greediness for food. But then after a few hours, we stop masticating. We have nothing more in the stomach. It's the beauty rate of the gut microbiota, which is lowering our feeling or our envy of eating. So normally the beauty, rate, the beauty rate is stopping that, but with the excess acetate produced by the gut microbiota of obese people, you go into dysregulation, eating more, and making more reserves from what you get from your food. So you see, they are at the door, but they also are busy indirectly on what is happening inside. And you know, this story of the fact that some microbiota are producing obesity remembers me of another story. You may know that it was for long 
uh, a mystery to understand why giving low level of antibiotics to animals was making them becoming healthier. Because the level of antibiotics that were applied were much lower than for having a true antibiotic effect on pathogens and so on. So it was not a kind of preventive effect. It was something else not so well understood. And we know now that simply the perturbation <coughs> induced on the microbiota by those low level of antibiotics was simply promoting an obesogenic microbiota. And when you look at the composition of the gut microbiota of animal which receives those low levels of antibiotic, there is a subtle change in the microbiota which is different from non-treated animals and much less diverse. Exactly the trend you have for obesogenous or obesogenic microbiota. But there is more. They not only influence our metabolism and reserve making and functioning of the physiology, but they also influence the behavior of the animals. I will just show you a couple of data on stress and interaction between animals. This is the story of mice that were stressed or grown in non-stressing conditions. When you take uh, those animals, the level of corticosterone, an hormone related to stress, is much higher when you stress them. That's expected after stress. You are secreting the hormones which are making uh, all the reactions coping more or less with stress at a huge energy cost, of course. Now let's feed those animals by uh, <laughs> Lactobacillus, Lactobacillus rhamnosus. By the way, this Lactobacillus rhamnosus has the same impact on humans. So normally I show the slides on humans, but here for you I was digging out the slides on mice. Uh, and you see that when they are treated, there is a difference, but there is a significant lower accumulation of corticosterone as compared to the non-Lactobacillus rhamnosus mice. So you still have stress, but it's producing much less corticosterone. Now, let's go into something which is more behavioral, which is more integrating the status of the animal. It, there was this note that uh, when you feed a mother during the pregnancy with a rich diet, so during the pregnancy and after the, the birth of the, <coughs> of the young mice, if you give a rich diet, rich in, uh, in lipids and rich in proteins, versus a, a diet made of more fibers, you see that the offspring, the offspring, it's a funny transgenerational effect. The offspring are, is much less interacting when the mother received a rich diet. So what your mother is eating makes, makes you more or less prone to communicate with other mice. It's estimated by time of interaction with other individuals in the same cage. It turned out soon that one of the difference, but this is purely correlative, one of the difference between those offspring and those ones was that when there was a rich diet, the gut bacteria were significantly depleted or even there was even no lactobacillus reutery. But this is pure correlation. Well, of course, because of this correlation, the scientists decided to take those offspring with a rich, from a mother with a rich diet and reintroduce, force probiotically the reintroduction of lactobacillus reuteri. And what did they find? What did they find? They reverted the phenotype just by adding this bacteria. And it's funny that you can manipulate the awareness or the contact to others by bacteria. And it opens a lot uh, on not only the way of uh, uh, handling cattle or handling animals, but also the way of maybe tomorrow of handling humans, health and relationships. I let you on that and I go to my last point. We are in an area where you know biodiversity is decreasing everywhere. By the way, you already heard, I mentioned it, that in obese people there is a kind of reduction of biodiversity in terms of gut microbiota. Gut microbiota are also in this area of biodiversity extinction. 
the gait of our organisms are in the modern society much less microbial than they were in the wild. Let's start with human, if you want, and we'll come back to animals later. Here is a saturation curve obtained by uh, sequencing effort, increasing sequencing effort of feces of group of people that are either from non-contacted tribes. By non-contacted, you should understand that they had no contact with occidental civilizations of people. So only the dung were harvested, not more. Those are Amazonian groups of people. Those two Amazonian groups of people have more or less contact, not a lot, but they have some contact with Europeans. And those are, in, in yellow, US citizens. You see that US citizens have only two-thirds of the diversity of Yanomami and that Guahibo and Malawi, which are partially contacted, have intermediate richness. So you see this decrease of richness which is associated with the gradient from ancestral type of life to occidental type of life. That's well characterized. The other thing is that when you look at the composition in a PCOA analysis of the composition of the microbiota, you see that the US are very different in terms of composition from the Guahabi uh, Guahibo and Malawi, sorry, and also from the Yanomami. There is one Yanomami here which is a bit funny because he, he may have a bit of contact with some Malawi, but we don't know exactly what he's doing with Malawi, so, well, <laughs> bizarre point. Anyway, you see that Yanomami are there, <laughs> US citizens are there, and the partially contacted populations are in between. It's a funny trend, but it's not so funny when you think of it because there is another story which is connected to that one. This other story starts like a good news. Over the 50, 60, 70 last years, we were killing most of the bacteria and virus we didn't want. And we end up with reducing a lot of loads, at least in occidental civilizations. We were able to reduce the load of many illness. But at the same time, it happened that many illness that we don't want were growing, prodigiously growing. For example, metabolic diseases like obesity or type 1 or type 2, diabetes. Ma uh, illness of the immune system like multiple sclerosis, Crohn's diseases, where the immune system is simply killing the body. Or overreacting immune system like asthma, or if you have children, you may know that, dermatitis, uh, atopic dermatitis, which is a skin rash, very painful which is now a problem for one-third of the children of under five years. So, immune system, metabolism is not working well. Sometimes it's also the brain. Autism was uh, multiplied by three times in ten years in occidental civilizations. Now, one child out of 158 births is more or less, at various level, having autistic syndromes. Can you guess that? Autism was unnoticed at the beginning of the 20th century. Asthma had no name until 1906. <laughs> this illness, indeed, you can't find them in Amazonia, or hardly. If you look carefully, you will find them, but at a very low level. What's up? If you look at the gut microbiota, but also even the lung microbiota or the skin microbiota of people that are either ill or healthy for all the illness I mentioned, you can see that they don't have exactly the same composition and that on average there is much less diversity in people which have the symptoms. Is it a cause or a consequence? First, I showed it to you on obesity. When you give those microbiota from ill people to mice, you end up with mice having subtly but surely symptoms that are reminiscent of the symptoms of the illness. Like, for example, if you get autistic microbiota to mice, they interact less with the animals from the same cage. Second, when you transfer microbiota from healthy individual to ill individual, you reduce for some time the level of the symptoms. So, for some time only and not fully, which means that there are other cause also acting, but that microbiota is part of the causes. So, coming there, we experience in ourselves a reduction of biodiversity, 
which is reducing the efficiency of the microbiota to play its normal role at the gate of our organisms, and which is enhancing the development of some illness. And then comes the question, what about the animals we captured in nature, and what about the animals we domesticated? The story is not fun, because they have the same problem. If <laughs> you go to captivity, <laughs> we all undergo some kind of captivity, you know. Uh, <laughs> so if you go to captivity, for example, and compare animal in the wild and on captivity, you see that the animal in the wild, so it's a PCOA analysis of uh, primate uh, gut microbiota compared to humans, uh, you see that in the wild, the composition is much more distal from human than when those primates are grown in captivity. In captivity, this is the, uh, those uh, gray points here, those brown points, sorry. You see that the gut microbiota tends to resemble that of humans. Probably, in fact, because the food resembles that of human. But uh, the fact is that when you in, uh, look at that more carefully, you see that there is more Prevotella and Bacteroidetes. That, that's the facts for all those animals. And this is driving the similarity to humans. But more interestingly, if you look at the diversity, you can see that in the wild, it's higher than for semi-captive individuals, which are contacted by humans, but still foraging around. And it's even less when they are captive. So they experience a change in quality, but also a reduction in diversity of their microbiota. Another funny story was investigating animals in captivity versus from the Kalahari Reserve. And for many individuals that were investigated, there is a significant change in the number of bacterial species present in the gut. Most of the time, it's a reduction, which is significant for uh, all those animals, like dogs, for example. But which is interesting is that there is only one exception, which has rhinos. Rhinos, they have more diversity in captivity. But with exception of, of rhinos, on average, there is a reduction of diversity. OK, so now you will tell me that it's a funny story, but uh, we don't mind. The question is, what is the health of those animals? Well, just one thing before we we go back to the end of that, you see that there is more firmicutes and more bacteroidetes in most samples. And this is what, just what I told you about Prevotella uh, and bacteroidetes before. It's really a trend. When you approach humans, you tend to have a lot of that. And it's not a good news, because those groups are the ones which are obesogenic. Well, captive and domesticated animals tend to be more often ob obese than in the wild. But Let's come to this. Biodiversity extension is not only a an extension of species, it's an extension of functions. There are things that were made before that are not made after the extinction, and this is reflected in the health of the animals. Let's go now to fully domesticated in the an animals, lab mice. We have those from the lab. They are not axenic, okay? Those are the normal ones from the lab in a dirty cage. And when you compare them to uh, the mice captured in different locations in the wild versus different labs in the US, you can see that the diversity, the microbial diversity, is not the same. And there is a group, which are proteobacteria, which is quite abundant in the gut in the wild, which is nearly absent. It's, it's nearly, but honestly, on the diagram, it's nearly fully absent from the lab. While firmicutes, once again, are invading the gut microbiota. So you don't see that domesticated individuals, they tend to have a different microbiota. Now, what is the consequence? In the same paper, which is an outstanding one in my view, they were investigating three, times, uh, three types of mice. Those from the lab, simply. And germ-free mice, with, on which they were transferring either the microbiota of lab mice or the microbiota of wild mice. So I call it a lab microbiota, but it's microbiota from a mice from the lab. Or wild microbiota is a microbiota from mice from the wild. And then they were challenging those animals with, 
if you read the paper, tons of things, okay? But I will only take one thing, influenza A virus, which is killing mice. And so you see that the survival is uh, rather good for those who receive the wild microbiota and rather poor for those that are either grown in the lab or received, being germ-free, the lab microbiota. You go to 20% survival upon 10 days. But in the wild, it's not so much of a problem to get this. And if you look at the, uh, the titer of this virus in the lungs, where it's making the most uh, uh, problematic uh, issues, you can see that uh, the title is uh, significantly higher for lab and germ-free lab mice than for germ-free mice that receive the wild microbiota. So really, our domesticated animals, they lost the diversity and they have the same problem that we have with the modern microbiota in our own body. There is a biodiversity extinction leading to less function that are vital for a healthy response to many things. So, we, we are at the end of this story, but uh, it's only the beginning of the true story that you will make. Uh, the microbes are there, and they are active. And the less microbe we have, the less those activities are there. It's not a new story. I would like each of us to feel deeply guilty at this point. A bestseller from the 69, wrote, written by Rosebery, very rude by normal people, but maybe not by scientists, or maybe not by technicians, was life on man. At the time, you know, it was life on moon, life on Mars, but simply, Rosebery was working on the bacteria of the body, and he was making this book to report that, he says that in the book, a germ-free animal is, by, large, by and large, a miserable creature. He was already claiming all I told you in the desert. Because at the time, no one was listening to that. It means that somewhere, someone is saying something that we don't hear. And that is a tool for the future. But clearly now, we have to imagine that when we feed animals, that's my contribution to your discussion, and you may find it a bit stupid, but you don't feed an animal. You feed a bacterial and a bit yeast ecosystem, which is allowing the animal to develop. If you think of that, I think that there is room for improvement in the way we handle domestic animals by considering that they are microbial ecosystems. It's only a way of seeing them, but clearly there is a lot of heuristics. There is a lot of new procedure to imagine when looking at them from this angle of view, this point of view, that we never before uh, were considering. And it means that in terms of the door, you know, very often we like cleaning in front of our doors. But, you know, a dirty door may be better than a clean door in this respect. This idea of clean dirtiness is not a paradox. It's not a paradox. It means simply that our technical and cultural standards are now too few contaminated as compared to the biological standards of animals and humans. And this is a big challenge for the future to reintroduce a dirtiness that is a contamination that will not reintroduce the diseases we try to escape, but which, which will reintroduce all the diversity we need to restore the functions we lost in domesticated animals or westernized occidental people. Well, you don't see them, but they are there by millions. On those pictures, you see maybe animals, but I see microbial communities and billions of billions of microbes. As you said, uh, all those animals are never alone. This is the French word for it. Jamais seul. They are never alone. So, of course, it could be the title of a book. Uh, it's even a book in Polish, as you said. But once again, clean means dirty. And this is what we have to imagine for the future. And I don't know if it's uh, an easy step to go forward in this direction. I'm sure we need a generation. 
We need a generation not to laugh when you see clean dirtiness, uh, but we have to go forward in this direction. There is kind of emergency. This is one of the points where biodiversity decrease is crucially problematic for the future. Thank you for your attention.